Hi, this is Pat Morin with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another 6-5 podcast. It is Friday morning, about one hour earlier than we normally do it, but Daniel and I are getting ready to hit F1 Austin for the weekend. We've got to catch buses. We've got to have meetings. We've got to get ready for that paddock club. But anyways, Daniel, how are you? Hey, Mr. Moorhead, I'm feeling good. I'm very excited about uh, about heading to F1. Um, got a little bit of a car bug, so this is going to hopefully fill that void. Uh, first time, I'm not going to lie, I don't have a ton of F1 experience. I know I like watching cars go fast, and I like driving them fast even more. But uh, it should be a great day. But for everyone out there, before you feel, you know, you know, like we, we have the, too much of the good life. We do have to work. This is not all play. Um, there's going to be meetings and we're going to be running pretty fast between them. So a little bit of watching, a little bit of racing, a little bit of writing, a little bit of chatting, a little bit of podcasting. But, uh, Pat, it's going to be a good day today. No, I know. I mean, this is my favorite day uh, day of the week. I almost said favorite day of the day. Uh, OK, it's early, folks. Just, just just work with me here. But no, we've got a great show today. And uh, for those of you who are joining for the first time, uh, the 6-5 podcast, uh, we cover six topics, five minutes each, a little light on the news to get context, but we really try to get underneath the meaning of the news. We're going to talk about publicly traded companies today and, and their earnings. Um, please don't take anything we say as investment uh, advice. Uh, talk to an expert before you do anything so with that i mean we have intel ibm zoho sap honeywell and micron we have a full plate today daniel let's jump into intel q3 results and by the way judging by the pre-market uh they the company did not um did not fare well last night but i have to tell you and you can move to the next uh, Chiron. I got to tell you, I don't fully understand this one, uh, my friend. And maybe it's because I'm looking at the uh, the long ball. But uh, I think one of the one of the biggest things that hit was the realization that building uh, making twenty billion dollars in investments might actually cost the company. Uh, and capex was put in there, and margins that were in. Uh, the low 50s. Now, most people recognize Intel in being in the mid 60s. Uh, and but 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 here's the thing, folks. You know, over time, you invest your capex. It goes against cost of goods sold, and this stuff is expensive. And we also had the CFO um, who has decided to retire. Uh, I can never remember his last name, but his first name is George, and I recognize him as George because he used to be Qualcomm's. Uh, CFO. And it, it's interesting. Um, George, George Davis, is, Pat. George Davis. Thank you. An easy you. one. Thank you. Um, but but anyways, uh, George had a reputation for being a a, a cost cutter. It's funny. I, I had um, um, uh, some people say, hey, all CFOs are cost cutters uh, out there on Twitter. Uh, well, they are, but uh, CFOs need to be aligned with their CEOs. And I don't believe the previous Intel CEO uh, was going to be spending $20 billion on fabs. In fact, I believe he was likely leaning in the direction of getting out of fabs. And then Pat Gelsinger came in, and it's a whole different ball game. But net-net, uh, forecast plus gross margin pressure plus probably a couple other things you're going to talk about, Daniel, uh, is weighing very heavily uh, on on the stock right now. Yeah, the company had 10 straight quarters of beating revenue expectations. And this was the first time in those 10 quarters the company came up short. And I think largely the demise of Intel has been pretty overstated. But the problem is, and, uh, you know, it, I don't know how else to say it, but the standard that Intel is held to is a different standard than every other company in the chip space. Their results are scrutinized at a different level, and any result that's not terrific seems to get met with a whole lot of negativity. So there's a lot of bearish sentiment. And you can probably attribute some of this to the rapid growth of Lisa Su and AMD, uh, Jensen Wong and NVIDIA, people seeing that this fabulous 
process. Uh, of course, Qual- Qualcomm has had good numbers too, but this 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 whole approach that all these fabulous chip makers in the US have had has been exponential. The growth has been exponential, and their stocks have been rewarded for it. Intel is the incumbent. Intel is the company that held massive market share. Intel is the company that everybody was set out to beat, and for the longest time, nobody could do it. And now you're starting to see small bits of market erosion in the in the client. It's been more substantial on the data center side. It's been a little slower, but that's started to happen too. And even though Intel still has really great market share in all these areas, the fact that people are starting to eat off of their plate has not been well received by the market. Now, if you look at this quarter, you know CCG. Now, there's a couple of factors at play, right? We're starting to see PC demand numbers. Uh, There's more question for the first time since the pandemic of whether growth and the TAM expansion will continue. Um, You know, our friends at IDC uh, have a very small upward adjustment over the next few quarters for the year. Uh, And and Gartner is saying it's going to start to contract. Now, again, I actually tend to believe these secular trends are going to be sustained and that growth for PCs will continue. Um, that there is more growth than is being explained. But then there's other pressure. So CCG, again, was down after having a really great 30 plus percent quarter last quarter. Um, But the other thing you got happening is Apple numbers are rolling off. So Apple, um, you know, if you actually take out year over year for Apple, which we've already baked into the company's valuation, um, it would be up probably high single digits because Apple, you know, had a significant amount of revenue. They just got pulled out of that number. So there's a lot of factors there. And of course, supply constraints. All I'll say is for both CCG and DCG, the data center and client group, is that going into the next quarter, um, when we hear the earnings next week, is if the other fabulous chip makers have great results, this is going to not bode well for Intel. But if the supply constraints are held true and the other companies validate this by having slower growth, it doesn't have to be no growth, it's just slower than what they've had the last few quarters, um, I, I feel like this will be validated that Intel's still on the right track. And remember, they still grew year over year. Um, there's a lot more I could talk about, Pat. I'll just, I want to just make one point to one thing because we could spend 20 minutes on this topic alone and we just don't have that kind of time here on the 6.5. Um, there's some really good adjacent businesses at Intel. Um, the Mobileye business has had a multiple record quarters, which means they've got some really good play heading into the... Um, uh, automotive ADAS, but then they've added robo-taxi technology, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then the IoT business just hit a billion dollars and had a 54% year-over-year growth, Pat. So not everything's bad, not everything's gloomy. You mentioned those big investments. That's going to take some time. I'm confident in the long run that Intel's got a lot of the right pieces in place. And of course, the bet on Pat Gelsinger, I think the consensus is that was a good bet. It was about as good as they could have done with the CEO. But the next few quarters are going to be very telling. Yeah, it's hard to believe they beat on EPS by 54%. Now, they missed revenue by 1%, but there's even some debate uh, about, you know, where does that consensus come from? Did it include NAND or, 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 or didn't it? Uh, but anyways, uh, we, we will see down 10%. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's pretty rough. But uh, let's move to uh, IBM earnings. Uh, IBM got, got hit pretty hard. Um, you know, they're Looks to be a little bit of a, a pause until uh, the Kindrel uh, split. But uh, Daniel, why don't you uh, why don't you kick this one off? It was a mixed result. The company came in a little above on earnings, a little below on revenue. Um, listening to the commentary in the earnings call, it seems that you know the GTS business has been an absolute boat anchor for this company over the last uh, you know <laughs> four years. But I mean, for a continued and sustained period of time, it's time for that business to close a lot of things that would typically be moving or pausing. And they talked about this, you know, um, Kavna, the CFO, talked about, you know, kind of this Kindrel pause, you know, uh, the sales slowing down. Companies normally would be signing contracts or saying, you know what, let's just wait until this deal is done. We're a few weeks away, um, you know, and this is really the start of the new era for IBM, Pat. I, I don't want to dismiss any quarter, but I kind of I think I tweeted something along the lines of, I just don't think this quarter matters. I just don't think it does. You know, of course, for, you know, short-term traders, uh, they're going to be feeling the heat of a sell-off. But for long-term investors in a value company like IBM, this is all about getting the company to more significant growth. Um, It's been kind of, you know, vacillating between single-digit losses and single-digit growth now for feels like a decade. Uh, It has not been able to sustain significant long-term growth. It's very... 
uh, driven by certain cycles like the Z cycle or the Z15 cycle for the mainframe. Systems can't make money late in the Z cycle. Uh, so when that starts to slow down, it, systems just can't perform. And so we got to wait for the next generation. Ross Moore and his team, I'm sure, have something up their sleeve. Um, but that's going to be a requirement for systems to make money. So even when cloud is up, what it was like about 12%, I believe was the number right. here. Red Hat was growing. It can't offset uh, huge underperformances from the GTS business. And it can't offset the cyclicality of the systems business, especially related to the mainframe. So, you know, when I kind of look at this, Pat, I basically say we need to give it two more quarters. I know this is a long time for most investors to allow the spinoff to happen and to allow the company to really get focused on its uh, its initiatives, which is all in on hybrid cloud. Uh, and then, of course, AI and software. That's, those are the areas where, where the company is really going to put its focus. Then we need to start to hold it accountable to grow, Pat. We, it, it needs to grow faster. I mean, Red Hat was a great bet. You know, it's out with it's out with GTS in with Red Hat. The future is Red Hat. The future is hybrid. Um, the whole thing is being the enterprise hybrid cloud company. It's about connecting, uh, you know, core to edge, hybrid cloud, open uh, open shift, and doing it in a more meaningful way. But they have to catch up in growth with the public cloud players. I'm not talking about hyper growth uh, SaaS companies. I'm just talking about your AWSs. I'm talking about you know the cloud business needs to be growing 30 percent. That's what the market's going to want to see. You know, uh, when when Microsoft uh, and, and, and AWS and Google and Oracle are all growing that fast, IBM is not going to be held to a different standard. And so that faster growth is going to be required. And that faster growth, by the way, Pat, is how they get to an 8 to 10% overall growth. So I'm not saying the whole company needs to be growing 30%. I'm just saying you can't have say we're all in on this business. It's a hyper growth area with a rapidly expanding TAM and then constantly have you know, growth rates that are a third or a fifth, or in the case of Oracle, a tenth of the rate of their of their competitors uh, or, or complementary companies in the industry's growth. So that's where, I, where I'm really looking for here. I give them a pass on this quarter, Pat, and I actually give them a pass on the next two quarters. Uh, hopefully they'll show some promise, especially on the hybrid cloud business, but you got to let them settle. These acquisitions and a merger uh, or a spinoff of this size is going to take some time to settle in. So Daniel, this one is this one's a, a, a toughie because I think we 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 need to first of all review the commitment the company has made, and that is single digit growth overall. That's all they're committing starting uh, twenty uh, FY twenty twenty two. Okay, now I would like you know I mean just 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 like I would like a red wagon, a new red wagon every year for their cloud revenue to be you know thirty percent. Uh, every year, so it's a, it's around a seven billion dollar business. That's half of of what a, AWS is, is is today. But Daniel, I, I don't think they're they're committing to that. I and I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. What you're saying is is to truly have the stock move as opposed to doing what it's doing today. Because I feel like single digit growth, they're positioning themselves as as the safe as the safe bet. Yeah. Right. Dividends. Yeah, so just, just quickly, yeah. I'll, I'll say, Pat. You know, I'm I'm basically saying they were getting single digit growth more than not over the past year or so. It was uh, like, but, but Daniel, low, low previous income. five years they didn't. I mean, no, I get it. Under prior get it. CEO, they barely grew. I get it. Ever. I'm just saying that what I guess I'm saying is where does enough growth come from consistently to offset the cyclicalities and such of other businesses so that they're sustainably yeah. delivering those single digit numbers? So as I said. Cloud has to grow fast enough and significantly enough to allow them to get to those mid or high single digit growth quarter over quarter as a whole company. So that yeah. was what I was saying. It has to come from the cloud business. Yeah. Now, the, the best point I think you made was uh, <laughs> if if Oracle uh, if Oracle is is growing and uh, maybe a Dell or an HPE is growing. Uh, beyond kind of mid single digits, then then it's a challenge. Now HPE is committed to that single digit growth as well, so it's likely not gonna not gonna be them. But you know, to your point, you know, the stuff that should be growing, most of it is growing, right? You know, GBS related cloud revenue up thirty eight percent, cloud and cognitive cloud software twenty percent, uh, Red Hat twenty three percent. Um, but, um, you know, 
maybe something like quantum will be one of these big uh, breakouts. I mean, I think um, they probably, you know, we just saw INQ go public. They have, um, and, and my guess is, is that IBM likely has 25 times more revenue than INQ when it comes to quantum. Uh, I hope they would drop that at some point because that could be an instant um, injection. I don't, I don't think the market's giving them, I, I think it's giving them zero value uh, for quantum uh, right now to take them into kind of a, a, a mega growth. But a uh, great conversation. Yeah, probably not an indicative quarter of the future. It's absolutely not. We'll have to see uh, next quarter, excuse me, when we get to the uh, the full uh, Kindrel uh, uh, spin out. And, and maybe we can even do a, uh, a separate video uh, uh, on that. A good debate. But hey, let's let's go to SaaS. Uh, Zoho announced the updates to its uh, one uh, platform. And, you know, if, if anything, you know, I think my biggest takeaway uh, from this, Daniel, I'm going to give you uh, most of the mic here. Um, they um, absolutely are, are having incredible growth in their platform. You know, very similar to, to what we're seeing uh, in uh, Salesforce. Uh, SaaS is hot. And whether it's SaaS for Microsoft, Google, or or people like uh, Salesforce, you know they're in that forty percent uh, growth range. And you know the the kind of the mystery of Zoho is that they're a private company. You don't typically uh, get uh, the type of information that we get from public companies. But I do appreciate, particularly under under um, non disclosure, they do give analysts growth. Uh, numbers and the numbers are really good. And you know, outside of a public company, it 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 matters. It matters because it should give other potential customers uh, a, a a boost. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we we always go crazy over the Netsuite numbers uh, from Oracle, as we should. Just had a great uh, uh, six five insider uh, with. You know, Evan, the, the co-founder uh, of NetSuite and, you know, Zoho's uh, numbers and growth uh, are very similar on a percentage basis to uh, uh, to NetSuite. Yeah, it was fun. I was actually going to frame that. Uh, it was good to talk to Evan Goldberg and Jason Maynard, the, the leaders of the NetSuite business. We were at their event, Sweet World, and just kind of to pivot to Zoho was the focus on that that small or mid-sized enterprise, you know, the we, we've outgrown QuickBooks, now what? <laughs> and that market's been somewhat, um, you know, underserved. And I think that's why companies like Zoho have been so successful. It's not that companies haven't tried, it's that the needs are different. But the thing is, is a lot of fast growth these days means the needs are, you know, extensible. And you can't just, uh, you can't just ask people to come over for a little bit. You need to build tools that can, they can expand on and grow on. And, and when we talk to NetSuite and with Zoho, we've also seen that while they are sort of maybe most well known for serving that small and mid-sized enterprise, they actually do grow up to be pretty yeah. extensive platforms that can be utilized by much larger companies. And so with Zoho, the company is, is, you know, they're, they're very, poised and they're very kind of coy about their success most of the time. But at, this, at the same time, they're just winning with numbers. They're winning with customers. They're winning with growth. And so, you know, this is a four-year-old plus, four-plus-year-old platform now. And this week, the company just came out with a whole bunch of new updates. Now, the thing that I really like about it, Pat, and we run companies that probably would be well-defined within their scope, is is the platform is really designed to achieve and, and, and manage all the needs of a customer. You know, as a small company, access to things like analytics, AI, project management tools, collaboration, all in one suite, almost is non-existent. You can get it from the big, uh, you know, the big software vendors, but their tools are built for enterprise. So you're kind of figuring out a way to make an enterprise tool fit into a smaller company. So it's kind of the opposite. It's built for small to scale. And, and yeah. like I said, that's that's what I what I really like. Some of the stuff they're doing with third-party data prep, um, NLP-powered searches, uh, big uh, big list. I think over 1,500 analytics uh, reports and dashboards that come out of the, uh, the tool. They're adding mobile application management. Uh, they're adding a learning platform. They're adding a uh, employee, um, like a uh, augmented reality platform for called Zoho Lens. Um, and so they've got all kinds of different applications. And, and I really like the fact that, like I said, that they're addressing a market that needs to be addressed. Um, as I see it going forward, 
this is the biggest opportunity for software, uh, you know, for companies like Zoho is to serve that middle of the market. And so the enhancements, the platform, the, you know, basically the unification of all these tools, get them all in one place. You add them as you need them. I think it's over 50 tools. So it's a huge subset of different uh, software. But what I probably like the most in the end is, is access to analytics. Access to analytics is what a lot of these updates focus on is that companies that use analytics win more than companies that don't. Companies that can apply their data in a meaningful way. Smaller companies just struggle with this. They don't have data scientists. They don't have resources. They don't have people that can really deal with these big, complex data management tools. And that's why they struggle to grow. The tools here to help companies start to embrace analytics are, you know, they're significant and they're available and they're they're easy to use. So good on Zoho. It's a company that, again, I think we talk about because, frankly, it needs to be talked about more. We, of course, cover the Oracles and the Salesforces and the Microsofts, and those companies do great things winning tons of business up at that enterprise level. But there are so many small businesses that just get don't get a lot of attention. So it's good to see a company like Zoho stepping up here. Zoho One updates are solid, but moreover, it's just about the platform itself, Pat. Yeah, I love that they're they're in a position where everybody wants to go, which is they've got IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. They have interchangeable services that if you want to bring your best of breed uh, software uh, th- th- that you had, um, uh, and it's it's fully cloud native. So it's just it's just kind of funny how they are they're right where everybody else wants to be, and then so so few people are are aware uh, of the company. But hey, let's move uh, on. SAP had a, a really uh, good quarter, and it was super encouraging. Um, a huge uh, surge with uh, rise. But you know, let's focus on cloud. Twenty four percent cloud backlog. Uh, and even S4 HANA was up 60%. Uh, percent. Now, I know I'm talking backlogs and, and not revenue, but with a company like SAP, uh, that matters. Now, raw cloud revenue, real revenue is up uh, up 20%. And that's super encouraging, you know, Daniel, because, you know, SAP um, is not looked at uh, as, a, as a cloud company, and it's because they don't have an IaaS, but it's funny, when, when you look at uh, well, and and they don't have have a SaaS service or or you know SAP as a service, they work through partners. And in the end, I think SAP realized uh, what they could do best, um, which uh, is what they're doing. And then let's leverage uh, best in breed uh, IaaS companies to be able to deliver. Uh, their their services and you know we can we can pick apart uh, the strategy uh, you know uh, what we think about that I, I believe that they that they've been pretty beat beaten up uh, over over the past couple of years um, because quite frankly if if you're not laying down that big uh, capex to build out your own uh, huge cloud capabilities uh, and you have to work uh, through partners it's going to take some time for revenue to kick in and the other thing is is most people with with a with a major uh, SAP uh, installation um, aren't quickly moving it, uh, like moving their front end website or something, right? You, you don't. <laughs> most people don't want to touch uh, ERP and and other uh, elements of of the stack because you know their entire ordering system, their factory systems are are dependent uh, on it, but. Net net, I, I think it was an excellent uh, quarter across all uh, all financial metrics. Yeah, I think the company, you know, I think uh, early in in 2021 they announced something called Rise with SAP, and it's um, it's not so much a new product, but the company I think recognized the significant challenge it was having in moving its com- its customers from prem to cloud, and so. Basically, Rise is, was all about the initiative to really help uh, customers s- s- standardize their, their transition, simplify the bundles, uh, s- create single contracts with SAP. So, yes, there are partners, but as far as the consumer or the user or the business, the enterprise is concerned, um, they're, they're consuming it like the cloud, managing SLA, operations, uh, issue management, not having different contracts for everything. I think that's where Rise is really starting to pay off for the company, and that's what's starting to show up in this quarter's numbers. Um, as you mentioned, Pat, you know, 
We just came off talking about growth. We talked about IBM's requirement for growth. SAP, I think, was in a similar sort of uh, holding pattern where they were constantly being scrutinized. Like, are they getting people to cloud fast enough? Yeah. And I think this is the number. You know, I'd say it's it's not, there's, there's not a, 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 this isn't pure science, although it is data point, is that 20% number, like, because, you know, again, when we've listened to the growth numbers of, of, Oracle's cloud, NetSuite with Dynamics 365, Salesforce as a mature product still tends to be in that high teens, low 20s in their core products every single quarter. And those are cloud native applications. SAP growth, of course, you know, what I like about the company, and I think they put it in their number, uh, it's in a little asterisk, but it's 77% is what they call more predictable revenue. That's sexy. I mean, look, a company that's 77% 77% of the revenue that they're booking on a quarterly basis, they know. That, yeah. That's really, that's something that people are very encouraged by. Oracle has a similar number. It creates a very stable environment for investors. It's stable for the companies to know that the revenue is there. The other thing is, you know, they're raising their guidance. Um, they think their profit outlook is good. Um, and, you know, that backlog, as you mentioned, it's it really has a lot to do with, you know, the, the it's not backlog like hardware. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a little bit different than that. This is more yeah. about, you know, fulfillment of, of subscription and that, you know, some companies refer to it more as like ARR. And so what's happening is they're growing the amount of annualized recurring revenue that's going to come in. And as they pivot off of licensing and traditional software agreements to this cloud base, it tends to be um, a value creator for the company. Uh, because the the stability of cloud, and by the way, the profitability of cloud is higher. You know, perpetual licensing is better up front, but I think every company on the planet has moved to consumption and cloud because in the long run, as you grow, you do better. And just ask uh, Andres and Horowitz when he did the assessment of public cloud, how that actually works. It starts off, the pendulum's on one side. As you grow, the pendulum's on the other side. But what you ideally create is a balance in the middle where you're paying a little bit more for the reliability, the stability, the flexibility, and agility that you get from the cloud. So good quarter for SAP. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, my my biggest question long term is, you know, can SAP reflect what Microsoft and Adobe did, which, you know, very, very good businesses uh 10 years ago, they were viewed as the absolute leaders. And and gosh, even back in 2000, my company, AMD, was using SAP. Uh, you know, c- can they make that turn? And, and I think it, it, is all, it is all about as a service. It's all about cloud. They do have some SaaS services in there uh, as well. And it's all about uh, software um, uh, that is subscription versus uh, straight, up, straight up licensing. A great analysis uh, let's move to Honeywell. Honeywell had their earnings this morning, uh, and and net net, you know, they beat EPS by by one percent. It was a uh, revenue miss by about two uh, percent, and you know, in, in pre trading right now, uh, it's looking about even to about down one uh, percent. Yeah, the the headline that you get from Honeywell and the headline from the street are a little bit different here. Um, I look at a company with the long, deep industrial roots growing, having 9% jump as a pretty healthy jump. I mean, we got to weigh in for inflation right now. Um, You've got to weigh in for the economic situation. Uh, But this is another example, a little bit like Intel, where it's like you're still growing and that's good. But the street, um, we'll see how they respond. I think it's going to be less volatile for Honeywell. Um, you know, the reason I think we keep coming back to Honeywell, besides uh, the fact that we've had the benefit of having a lot of access, being able to talk to their CEO, Darius Adamczyk, working with their quantum team, uh, getting to know the Forge business is that, you know, we, we it's kind of a, a little bit of a broken record, but it hasn't seemed to be fully appreciated by the market yet. As Honeywell is an industrial company that's in, in a significant transformation to a technology company. That's right. And so every time I, I will look at the quarterly numbers, what I'm kind of trying to do is get an indication of how well that transition is going. And so when I looked at this quarter, you know, to me, you know, this is still a company that's very balanced. We've got uh, the quantum business uh, being spun off with CQC. Um, but, you know, across it, you've got these uh, SaaS applications for safety and productivity. You've got Forge for the, you know, the edge and IoT for manufacturing. You've got 
the technology business for um, the buildings, uh, you look at something like return to work and where does a company like Honeywell fit in? And all I can say is, I mean, we're going to be absolutely hyper dependent. And then you start to look at areas like um, ESG, Pat, which you and I love to talk about. Um, and, you know, when you start to think about how a building provides, uh, you know, uh, cleanliness, uh, environmental, meeting environmental standards, um, safety for people who enter and exit these buildings and the footprint that companies leave, uh, you know, you, you're, we're going to be looking to companies like Honeywell to be building solutions that are going to integrate with, uh, you know, I talked about ServiceNow last week or Salesforce or Microsoft or Amazon or any of these companies or Google who are building these ESG footprints. This data that's going to come off of all of these edge and um, geographical buildings and locations and jet engines, and <laughs> it, it's going to be really, really interesting. So well, overall, you know, I'll be I'll be candid, you know, trying to find uh, as much to talk about in the tech end of Honeywell as there is to with an Intel or an IBM is still a little bit hard. It's a little bit nascent for me. But I think the real story here is, is the company making that leap? We keep talking about it. And so as I look at this, you know, you see 3% up on building solutions, but then you see like productivity, Pat, jumping 21%, right. which is where a lot of the software lives um, for the company, workflow solutions, productivity solutions. Um, so you're starting to see indicators that the investment in these technologies at the edge and within these buildings are growing and that Frankly, I think Honeywell's in a really interesting position, but you're right. They did miss what the street was looking for. So even though they grew 9%, not quite enough to make all happy. But in my opinion, those are the things we should be looking for. We should be looking for where's the growth in software. And, and I'll be candid, Pat. I keep putting pressure on, on, on the team over there. You guys have to start breaking this tech out. We need to know more about Forge. We need to know more about... Uh, um, uh, the building tech, the actual application investment that's going in, uh, especially now with quantum, you know, spinning, because that was one of those really strong disruptive technologies they were investing in. And although they'll still be invested in it structurally, it will no longer be under that broad Honeywell ticker. So that's kind of what I think. Uh, and I think uh, I'm really hopeful that your eyeball there doesn't <laughs> muck in you too much. Yeah, sorry about that. I was considering uh, taking myself out of the stream, uh, but, uh, you know, we're live you're drinking a monster. I'm drinking from my my Starbucks here. By the way, no, we are not being compensated by any of those companies. Wish we were. I'm just, I'm just thirsty. Exactly. Uh, listen, uh, Honeywell's an industrial that that is branching out uh, into tech, and I'm amazed that that they grew at all. Uh, they need real materials to grow, <laughs> right? And guess what? We're, we're in a massive supply chain uh, challenge. So a lot of the things. That, that Honeywell has to make out there relies on the supply chain that is currently uh, completely uh, messed up and not just electronics, but steel, right? Things like plastic uh, and, and things like that. So I am amazed and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the CQC Honeywell uh, merge and spin and just to see kind of the value in, and I believe Honeywell is going to have 51% still uh, of that deal. So I guess it's not a full, uh, necessarily a full spin, uh, you know, similar to something like a, like a Kindrel, but uh, I think there's a ton of value there. And, you know, I'll get back to INQ that set the, uh, set the bar. And it is likely that Honey, Honeywell uh, and CQC has at least as much revenue as, as INQ, which, and that, you know, I think we could pretty much safely say that, the street is is giving Honeywell zero credit for uh, quantum right now. So, Daniel, I, let's move. Sorry, you want to? No, I was just going to. I was just going to agree with you that you know absolutely, Pat. So we don't need to circle back on that. But I think you make a great point. Quantum is going to be a bigger focus this year, and all the companies that are in it eventually, it's got to start being added to those numbers. It is, and I'm pressing all companies now that uh, that there there is a certain valuation tied to at least a revenue number with INQ. Now's the time to bring it out, right? And you know, if you complain about not getting value for for quantum, show your numbers, right? Show your backlog. Show. Let's talk about deals. Let Let's get it out there. And anyways, I know I've been on calls with you where we have basically been saying the same thing. So I know you agree. So let's move to uh, Micron. 
Micron came out, right? We're used to like $20 billion commitments, uh, $60 billion commitments over five years. Micron came out with a $150 billion commitment over 10 years for uh, what they described to lean into memory. And it'll be memory and storage, but it's easier, I think, just to say memory. But let me, let me just give a little backdrop of, you know, aside from the number, uh, why memory is gonna be so important. So uh, uh, first off uh, on the consumer side, if you want faster twitch of applications, you want it in memory. You want more memory. We see it in PCs. We see it in in smartphones. Uh, you know, Apple came out. You know, albeit uh, a different kind of memory, uh, sixty four gigs uh, just on the Mac uh, MacBook Pro, uh, the sixteen and the fourteen inch. Uh, and also, what we see in in semiconductors is that due to Moore's law. Uh, and the the lack of ability to crank out these massive uh, die products, uh, HBM becomes the interconnect between, let's say, the CPU and the GPU or the FPGA. We see it with Xilinx. I mean, we see it with high-end uh, data center graphics cards, uh, the ability to, to connect those things uh, together. But the opportunity is even bigger, Daniel, uh, in the data center. So, so today, right, we can offload uh, networking, uh, we can offload the CPU, and we can offload uh, storage. And, and what I mean by offload is, is you disaggregate it, right? It's not all one thing, and you can leverage it as one fungible asset. But the one remaining thing, right, that you can't... Uh, composed today in the data center is memory. If you want more memory for an application, you can do it the slow way over a technology called RDMA, uh, which you know goes at the speed of, of basically of a network card, which is which is too too slow. And that that enables you to take what might be a scale up application and, and scale out. Uh, but if you need more memory, you need to buy a new CPU. Right, because this CPU is is linked uh, with with memory. I had a great conversation uh, with the gentleman at Micron, Raj Hazra, who runs uh, memory uh, over there, and I also had a great conversation with Jeremy, who uh, runs storage. But this new technology called CXL uh, is going to enable hyperscale data centers, AWS, Azure, GCP, IBM. Oracle to compose memory. And I've talked to all of them, Daniel, and they are super excited uh, about this technology, although none of them are publicly talking about it, although every one of them could do that. I believe that is going to enable just an absolute boom uh, for Micron, which again leads to uh, the requirement to, to invest $150 billion into fabs and i'll end with the customer sorry micron wasn't specific on where they're going to get the money but they were absolutely saying like intel that uh they're going to look to uh the governments uh to to dig into that uh for the very important reason of supply chain and national security and whether that's national security in the united states or over in western europe uh or for, uh, for that matter, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, everybody wants their own fabs. Yeah, you make a great series of points there, Pat. Uh, the $52 billion or so that was, uh, I, think, I think, put in the Senate's bill that's still sitting in the House, hasn't passed, certainly isn't going to cover all this investment. I also believe the amount of investment that has been put forth in the various um, you know, infrastructure bills for semiconductors simply isn't enough. The consensus globally is that some, if not much, uh, more semiconductor manufacturing, especially at the leading edge, uh, needs to be done here in the U.S., where effectively we're doing zero right now, if you don't count stuff that's being built either for self-purposes. Because I know IBM builds some of their own for themselves, but they're not actually building for anyone else anymore. Techni technically, 12% in the U.S., but that's not leading edge. Leading right, edge that's what I meant. Zero leading yeah. edge. Sorry, 12% total semiconductor yeah. manufacturing. Now, we do have Samsung 
and TSM and Intel broke ground on their additional fabs. There are things happening. This is multiple year process. And to your point, Pat, 30% of the semiconductor market is memory and storage. And these are different. It's a different process than, than CPUs. And so, you know, I always like to say memories and storage don't get a lot of uh, affection the way GPUs and high powered CPUs uh, often are fun to talk about, Pat, but try running an application without memory and storage and see how that works for you. It's kind of like when uh, I, to I told you about, you know, being challenged that semiconductors are not eating the world. And then you said to me, what are you going to run your apps on air? I mean, <laughs> look, this is this is the world that we live in is is this is an opportunity. You know, going back full circle to the Intel conversation, look, Gelsinger gets the one thing is that we need to be able to make more semiconductors. Even yeah. if Intel can't grow its TAM on all of its different products, they can make money manufacturing chips for these other companies that are growing. Um, right. They've already showed they won the ramp business with the federal government. Absolutely. Uh, guess what? It, AWS and, any, and a lot of vendors who have not spoken up will have to fab their stuff uh, at Intel. It's going to be a public opinion thing, Pat. How do you not work with a U.S.-based company that's creating U.S.-based jobs? And by the way, that's part of the story here with Micron. Is not only is it about you know manufacturing more and being opportunistic to make money, it's about doing good for this supply chain issue. You know, you're going to do more R&D. You're going to create more jobs. You're going to um, you know. By the way, this company's based in Boise. It's not a. It's not a. Um, you know, San Jose. They're they're actually distributing the tech around the world. And part of the reason I think sometimes they don't get as much coverage is because they're in Boise. By the way, beautiful part of the world. You should visit it if you haven't been there. Um, there. I'd go there over San Francisco anytime. No offense, San Francisco. Actually, take it for what you will. Um, but <laughs> truth be told, good stuff from Micron. The company is on the rise. It's got, uh, you know, some serious competition, but it's actually not as competitive as, as I would say some of this stuff in, in CPU and GPU is right now. And Micron's doing doing very well. And it's good to see this, Pat. It's good to see the company stepping up. I am going to be interested to watch where $150 billion comes from. But, you know, Pat, I, 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 the long tail gives the company time to create that cash flow, create that growth. And we all know one thing, computing isn't slowing and therefore memory and storage won't slow either. Absolutely. Uh, what a great topic to uh, to end on. We kind of wrapped uh, everything from regulation to Moore's Law uh, to national uh, security to supply chain all into uh, one micron conversation. Yeah, here's the thing. You know, Daniel, when you go 10 years out and you put a big number out, uh, you know, you can be you can be off by, you know, a factor of a lot and you're not going to be scrutinized. I think net net, uh, we can all agree that memory is more important than it's ever been. Uh, out there and i would say it, it is in should be on the same pedestal as a cpu and a gpu right now i just think that um you know the the investment that the uh that the cpu and gpu companies have put into the awareness compared to the memory companies uh is probably a factor uh difference of a thousand so it's going to take a while for for that to sink in but we can't uh we can't say it's not a reality because it is Hey, Pat, I just want to say one thing uh, unrelated to our six topics, but I want to let you know that the Digital World Acquisition Corp <laughs> is up, up 189% today. Now, this is a SPAC that's run by Trump that's going to be the next truth social network. This thing was 10 bucks yesterday morning. It is now at, it's breaking the entire market because it is literally everyone is chasing. This is the new GameStop. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. This network is going to crash and burn. Mark my words. Nothing. It's not, it's not an anti-Trump thing. It, it's just literally like, I just don't, this, it's not built on anything. This talk about building something on nothing. Yeah. Any fabs, not truth social network. Good Lord. Okay. Sorry about that. This Friday though, you know how I am. I'm sensitive about the markets and it's broken right now. Oh, it's, it's, it's great. And the market's always broken. And, you know, to be honest more with broken, you, Pat. it's more broken. Yeah. yeah. Well, what a great show. Uh, I just want to thank all of our listeners for uh, hanging in there. We are one episode away from a hundred. I know you can count, but Daniel, we still have to come up with some, I don't know, Episode 100, something huge. Hey, let's uh, do an earnings palooza. Oh my gosh. Yeah, everybody would be, be so excited about that. You know, no, I'm talking about, I don't know, should we do giveaways? Should we, should we, you know, bear something about our souls? Should we, you know, give away a, 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 a Toyota Camry? Uh, That's going to give away a chopper. You're going to give them your, 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 your helicopter that you fly around Austin. 
Oh, maybe maybe my ninja. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But anyways, uh, we really appreciate you hanging in with us uh, for 99 episodes. But even if you haven't and would like to give us some feedback, uh, uh, at Daniel Newman UV for all the negative stuff and at Patrick Moorhead for all the positive stuff on Twitter. Uh, but we really do appreciate you uh, and coming in an hour early. Hopefully you're not setting your watch on Friday based on you know, when we do our pod. But the great part is you can listen to it pretty much anywhere where podcasts and video casts are broadcast. And with that, have a great weekend and thank you so much.